our song so it'll be on the screen.
Wyatt, I believe we have singing. What are you singing today, brother? Andy? Andy. Andy walks with me when he talks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. boy can sing, can he? Amen. With my help, he could be great. <laughs> I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But that doesn't mean I don't enjoy spilling it every once in a while. Amen. Hey, the Lord said make a joyful noise. He didn't say pretty sound. Amen. Brother, I didn't have time to update that, so just leave it on the logo. We're heading to 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. You got a Bible? Hope you do. Grab one. If uh, you don't, in front of you, there should be one there. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one home with you. All right? Unless somebody put their personal Bible there, in which case, don't take it home. All right? <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians 16. I want to read one verse. I want to read verse number 9. This is something that I, I have uh, had on my heart for some time. And uh, I'll go ahead and ask now, whatever gentleman, Mike, Josh, somebody help me out with the sound system. Dial my mic down. 
I feel like I'm going to end up preaching. So, you never know. The Bible says this, verse number 9, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many, what? Adversaries. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful to be in your house this morning. And I, I know that out there we have all kinds of problems and trials and troubles and sorrows and issues. And most of us, most of us left some of that stuff in the parking lot and they're in our vehicles waiting on us. They're going to be in the office waiting on us tomorrow. They're going to be at work. They're going to be there at the uh, clock-in station. They're going to be there when we punch in to do our jobs Monday through Friday or Saturday if we're working OT. So Jesus, I just ask for those of us that, that maybe have some things on our minds, on our hearts, some issues we are facing, valleys we're in the middle of. And Jesus, here is the reality of this, and I don't shy away from this truth or this fact that, that God, I am not capable as a human being of speaking into these matters. Your spirit must accomplish that work. So God, I would ask that, that you would please take me out of the way and hide me behind the cross. I don't have any desire to be seen, heard, or remembered. I want to be a vessel used to preach the word this morning. That is what is of impact. That is a, uh, what is of eternal uh, significance. Nothing that I have to say as a man is going to make a hill of beans difference. And God, if your spirit shows up and takes your word and wields that in our minds and our hearts, each of us in a unique way, each of us in, in exactly where we are, then we're going to be spoken to, we're going to be moved a little bit closer to where we should be versus where we are right now. I ask of you, God, that you'd accomplish that. Those that are torn down, build them back up some today. I ask those that are discouraged, encourage them. Those that have uh, frustrations, may you show us solutions from within the pages of your word, brought to life supernaturally by the working of your spirit. God, this I'd ask in that precious and powerful name of Jesus, expecting nothing but victory. Amen. The Apostle Paul is a weird character. Did somebody dial this mic down? No? Oh, Mike, you're a saint. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the Apostle Paul is an interesting character. Uh, th this is a guy who went all over the known world preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, he did something that, that a lot of folks had no ability to do. Certainly Paul didn't have that ability, but the Spirit of God worked through him in accomplishing that. You and I uh, have grown up in this, what I would refer to as, and this is going to sound crazy given where we are, but where we started in America was predominantly a Christian culture. That's where we started. We started with, with, with this understanding that it's not a bad thing or a weird thing if you go to church. I was at a networking event of sorts, and by uh, networking, I mean it, I was supposed to be getting trained. And I was. It was a training session. And I'm meeting people from all over the place. And, and uh, I'm, I'm there because of the role that I now find myself in, uh, you know, down in the village. And so uh, th that's why I'm there. And, and during breaks, I do what I do, which is talk to people. And I find them, I start talking to them, and this one guy comes up to me, strikes up a conversation. He goes, man, you seem like an awesome guy. I said, thanks, you might be too. I want to be honest. You know, he could be a weirdo, I have no idea. And, uh, and he goes, oh, let, let, let me ask you this outside of this, because, you know, uh, your village mayor, right? that's not paying the bills full time. What else do you do? And I said, well, I have several businesses that I own and run, and uh, I, I also pastor a church. And he goes, you do what? I pastor a church. He goes, you're a Christian. And I said, yeah. And he goes, huh. And I went, that puzzled you. He goes, yeah, you seem smart. And I went, so the inference would be that because I, I place my faith in, in a God you can't see with your eyes, that I'm stupid. And he goes, no, I don't mean stupid. I just mean dumber than most. And I was like, oh, got it. Right and at this point, um, I, I go ahead and go into it like I don't know. It was probably eight, ten minute dissertation on exactly why I didn't check my brain at the door when I chose Christ. Right, and at the end of that conversation, he moved seats, and that's okay. I wasn't mean, wasn't rude. Before I left, though, he came up. We had a good conversation. He said, "You know, I'm going to have to rethink this whole church thing." He said, "I always kind of thought it was just fairy tale stuff," and he said some of the things that you laid out, I went and Googled it, and you actually were word for word on those things, and so 
now I don't know what to do. And I said, I can tell you what to do. I said, the, the, the gospel message is super simple. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's his shed blood. And I'm telling you, you are in a position of leadership. And there are coming times that lie ahead of us where men, women, and children are going to be confused and scared. And they're going to be out of their mind. And I'm just telling you, you are not the answer. You can't be their solution. And I'm not their solution. But I can tell you this. I get to point them to the one who is. It's Jesus Christ. Apparently, I got a little preaching because I turned around and like 15 people were looking too. That's okay. Apostle Paul was in that kind of a scenario, that kind of an environment all the time. He went into a city and he had nobody there that called themselves a Christian. And as a matter of fact, if he walked in there and said, I believe in one God and he's supreme over all the universe and by him all things consist. Isn't that what Colossians 1.18 tells us? It says that, that Jesus Christ, he created all things and by him all things consist. That is that his word literally holds the atoms and the molecules itself together in our universe. And by the way, scientists now look at how all of matter is put together and they go it shouldn't be staying together this doesn't make sense the dark matter and matter they don't equal each other out how is this whole universe not just randomly exploding can I tell you what that unseen force is it's the hand and the word of God itself he holds it together Paul had no such Christian culture to walk into And yet he makes this statement in verse 9. And he says, a great door is opened unto me. And then he calls it effectual. That is that it's going to be effective. You're doing a clinical trial on some medicine. What they want to know is called the efficacy rate. That is how effectual is it, how effective is it. And so Paul says, not just a great door has been opened unto me, but an effectual one, one that is actually going to work And he makes this odd statement at the end of it, tagged on to the end of it. He says this, and there are many, what, adversaries. Now, that doesn't make sense. That's not how we normally view things, is it? And if if I walk into a situation and, and I'm looking around and it seems like all the indicators say we're going down, I don't walk into that and be like, whoa, this is gonna be great. That's not how that works. We look at those indicators, we look at those individuals, we look at the people that are around us, we look at the relationships we have, we look at the bank account, we look at the stock market, we look at the job economy, we look at a thousand different things without even knowing it. As a matter of fact, we're handed something like 60 to 80,000 marketing and advertising messages per day. We're not aware of most of them. So we're looking at all these outward indications and and, and we're going, it seems like things are not great. And as the church, as Christians, as believers, we look at these things and our first instinct when we see what is unfolding in the world around us is to go, this is bad. It's to hunker up to dig in and stay put and us for and no more and hopefully we can somehow manage to navigate these waters but I don't know Paul looks at all the adversaries and he goes God's opening a door how wild is that how crazy is it to to, to think that, that some of the very things that ordinarily would discourage us could be some of the very things God uses to encourage us What if some of the the same things that tear us down ordinarily are some of the same things that God uses to build us up? See, with God, he views things differently than we do even. You guys aware of that? What what we see as as bad news, God can look at and go, oh yeah, I'm going to use that thing for something great. When I was young, younger than what I am now, my grandma, who I don't think is here today, 
pray for her. She's not feeling well, I think. And the cold would be dangerous for her lungs. So she stayed home, and I'm glad. But we'd go over to Grandma's house, and I never minded that. This is a little boy, and there's a big boy. Grandma always had one of a couple things in her house. Ordinarily, she had cookies, good cookies. I'm not talking about the Nestle Toll House stuff. And listen, I'm not knocking modern-day cooking. I'm just saying, man, a homemade biscuit isn't the same thing as the Pillsbury Doughboy. I love that dude. He just ain't as good as Grandma is what I'm trying to say. Most every Sunday now, it sounds like World War III going off, everybody cracking you know, in the morning, cracking them cans open on the side. Except for some of us that have never used it before. Watched a video online on the YouTube shorts thing, and this, and this gal had popped the very top of a biscuit can off, and she is trying for all she's worth to get the biscuits out of the back end. And I still wanted to be able to reach through my screen and go, just hit the side, honey, hit the side. You know, it'll pop, and the biscuits will be out. And she's like, this is a terrible experience. Grandma had cookies. Grandma sometimes had pineapple upside down cake. She'd have that an awful lot. That was good stuff. Grandma always had candy, so I always enjoyed going over there. What Grandma didn't have was modern toys. She didn't have a lot of toys to play with. She had the old stuff that Dad had, and Dad probably thought it was lame when he was a kid, and I definitely thought it was lame when I was uh, you know, three, four, five. So I would oftentimes sit there, and, and I would do as much stuff as I could, but Grandma was of the habit of getting a switch if you misbehaved, so sometimes you just ended up bored is what I'm saying. And I remember sitting there just staring at the wall, trying to figure out how long it would take the plant to grow. I'm like, wow, just spaced out, you know. I remember looking up, and Grandma's got this big wooden hoop, and, and she's stabbing a needle through it, and I was like, well, I like to stab things, you know. Like, so now I'm interested, sharp object danger. Something about danger attracts a little boy. You guys know what I'm talking about? You know, if you've ever raised, man, like we're living in a culture that go, little girls are the same as little boys. You've never raised either. No, you have not. They are not the same. Caleb looks for ways to hurt himself. He doesn't call it that, but he looks for ways to hurt himself. Little girls, a little Felicity, she's tucking her babies in and getting mad at brother because she's going to wake her babies up from their nap. Meanwhile, Caleb's trying to figure out how to spider monkey his way up to the top of the steps and drop down like Spider-Man. Right? They're just not wired the same. So I'm, I'm looking at that, and I see needle, I think dangerous, and I'm looking at this thing that she's building. It's just this mess of colors and thread, and it's all stringy, and it's all, it just looks like a blob. And I look up at, at my grandma, and I go, wow, grandma, that is super ugly. Anybody that knows Mary Martin knows that was stupid. <laughs> See, the odds were good she could have backhanded me where I sat, but she didn't. She kind of chuckles at me and she goes, oh, I bet it looks that way, doesn't it? And she pulls me up on her lap. At that time, I was small enough to fit on Mary's lap. Let that sink in for a minute. You seen Mary? Right? Uh, she pulls me up on her lap, and she goes, look at it from my side. And all of a sudden, I see this beautiful, this, all this water and these mountains in the background, and there's pine trees up in the front. And, and, and man, she's stitching all this stuff. She's working on a pine tree piece that was going to be right up front. And I went, wow, that's actually really pretty. And she goes, I know. You've got to look at it the right way. See, you and I see things sometimes not from God's side. We look at the, at, the, at the world going on around us. We look at every indication and everything that we see going on around us. And we go, God, this is a mess. It's a nightmare. I can't log on to social media. I can't check out Google. I can't hit any kind of a news app. And I see all kinds of stuff that are going on around me. And I don't get it. It looks so messed up. And I'm telling you, if you're willing to go, God, I don't want to see this as I see it. I want to see it as you see it. God will pull us up a little bit higher in our perspective. It will show it to us from here his point of view and I'm telling you when you see it how God sees it it's not at all the same thing what if and I haven't even gotten to the message I'm still in the intro don't get nervous the roast won't burn and I know we've got a bunch of folks to dump it's an oversimplification isn't it I'm going to get dunked it's all right. no need to be nervous dunked a bunch I haven't lost one yet 
pull them back up. Although I did one in a prison one time, boy come in, I asked him how much he weighed. He said, I don't know. I said, do you have any idea? He goes, the scale in the doctor's office drops off at 530. I went, fun. Pulling him back up, I, I threw my back out there. <laughs> I was like, now try to help me now. And he goes, nope. I'll try, but I don't think I'll be able to. Southeastern Correctional, fun time. What if you and I were willing to entertain the possibility that we, are in looking at the circumstances of our life, and I'm going to invite you to do something I ordinarily don't do, and I'm going to ask you to take something that maybe is on the top of your mind, a piece of baggage you're carrying, some issue, some battle you're going through. What if that very thing that you are looking at, there's another way to see it, and you don't see it from God's perspective right now? What if it was possible that some of the very things you think, I don't ever want to go through this circumstance, I don't want to ever go through this trial, I don't ever want to go through this, I don't want to be where I'm at right now. What if that very thing was the very thing that God would use to bring about something amazing in your life? Because Paul says there are many adversaries. And he says, but there's a great door that's opened unto you. What if you and I as the church of Jesus Christ, we took that approach what if when we saw everything that we see going on around us and we look at all of those circumstances and scenarios and bad indicators and there's rioting happening outside the White House and they're breaking down and riot police are getting involved and Putin just moved his tactical nukes over into Belarus and we're looking at all the bad things and what if the stock market crashes and what if that happens and did you see this piece of bad news and by the way, disease X is coming out and now we should all run around like our hair's on fire, right? Like, oh, it's killing 100% of the mice. That means it's going to wipe out all humanity. We're all going to be dead. Well, honey, if we're all going to be dead anyhow, I'd rather go praising God than I would be scared out of my mind. It's just how I feel about it. I'm telling you, I believe that we as a church, we as the church of Jesus Christ across the country, across the world, as believers, have an opportunity a great door that I believe God's opened for him to move, for him to work. I believe he wants to do it in my heart and in yours. I believe he wants to do it in my life and in yours. See, the very things that are driving people absolutely bonkers about the world means they are now hungry for some things they haven't had to be hungry for before. Let me explain what I mean. Ordinarily, my wife feeds me well. Anybody doubt that? She does. She's a great cook. I didn't have to suffer getting this fat. Some people are like, it's glands. No, I enjoy eating, all right? We come back, first day back from our honeymoon, she made a meal. She cooked 10 pound bag of potatoes into homemade mashed taters and made hamburger gravy to go over top of it. And then she wanted me to eat six pounds of it to show my love. Okay. I go to a place the other day. I'm down meeting a friend. I said, where do we want to go? And I was hungry. I didn't eat much the day before for whatever reason. Got up. I was so busy. Couldn't eat breakfast. So busy. I didn't get any kind of mid-morning snack. I haven't had anything. I am hungry at this point. And I walked into the Essen House and, and I walked past Bill. And I say hi to him. Say hi to some different folks. I am hungry at this point. I mean, I am starving at this point. Now, in reality, I'm not. I could have went eight months not ate anything. My body could have ate the calories. But I'm hungry. I walked past the salad bar. And I went, that looks good. <laughs> and I'm doing the math in my head, and I'm scanning the restaurant, and I'm going, there's at least 25 people in here, and at least two-thirds of them aren't eating, which means they haven't ordered yet, or they, are, they have ordered, and the cook's bad. I'm not going to get my order in time enough to get them there, which means I'm going to have to wait an, an additional 40 minutes. So <laughs> gravy and taters and all the fixings, 40-minute <laughs> wait, salad bar I can eat right now. 
you know what I ate? The salad bar. I came home and Miss Amy said, what did you do for lunch? I said, I ate the salad bar. She said, are you sick? <laughs> I said, no, I was hungry. On the flip side of that coin, one time in my life, I've been to a Brazilian steakhouse. You go to a Brazilian steakhouse, they give you a paddle. And I look at this paddle and I go, I'm not playing ping pong, I'm here to eat meat. And the waiter looks at me and he goes, no, 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 it's a green side and a red side. If that side is green, as we're coming out with all different kinds of meats, I mean steak and ribeye and, and, and ham and I, you name the meat, we've got it. We've even got some exotic cuts. If they see a green paddle up at your spot, they'll come and offer you a hunk of whatever they've brought out. And I said, son, do you have a double-sided green paddle? I don't want to accidentally be eating this and flip it over the other side and miss something. He goes, no, we don't. I said, all right. We'll take the chance. And he goes, okay. Two hours in, I did something I never thought I'd do. I flipped that paddle over. It was about, the, I, I ate four steaks. I don't know how much. I, I ate plate after plate after plate after plate of food. And at some point, the guy is discouraged. You can see the manager going, we should have gave him rolls. Why isn't he eating the rolls, you know? Like, should have fed him up with something else. I got so stuffed that I took that paddle and I said I'm done we live in a culture in America that has been so fed up so and we have had it so 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 good we really have America, land of the free, home of the brave. You were willing to work hard. You could make a living. You could carve something out. Nowadays, we've got kids that are being forced to either uh, partner up, and then i got a roommate or two or three roommates just to be able to make uh, the average mortgage payment, which the average mortgage payment across America, not true in our area, but across America is more than $2,000 a month. It means $24,000 a year is going to be coming out just for you to make a mortgage payment on average. I'm telling you, financial hard times are certainly upon us in this country, and they are globally. It's going to make us hungry. It's going to make the culture hungry. We have chaos that is spread everywhere. We've got wars and rumors of war, and people are hollering about Yemen and everything from Israel. And, and by the way, and some of this stuff, most of this stuff is biblical in its orientation. Which leads me to know that when people are struggling and hungry for internal peace, peace that the world cannot give them, they get told, well, read this book, and, and, and you'll, you'll feel at peace. Well, just make this move in your life, and you'll feel at peace. Well, you just got to get healthy. You know what your problem is? Your body's too alkaline. I had somebody tell me that. They've been preaching at a church, and they said, you know why you're fat? And I was like, because I eat too much food. And they go, no, because your body's too alkaline. I said, well, I'll pop a 9-volt out. We'll balance this thing out. We're living in a world that is absolutely filled to the brim with chaos. You know what that makes people hungry for? It makes them hungry for actual, lasting, eternal peace. And you know who has the answer? It's no news anchor. The news anchors don't have the answer. The courthouse doesn't have the answer. The White House certainly doesn't have any answers. Doesn't have any of that stuff. You know the only place where you can find the answer for lasting peace is in the pages of the Word of God anchored in the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ himself. That's the only place you're going to find peace. And I'm telling you, we've got an opportunity, a door God's opening to tell somebody that is struggling and doesn't have peace, I can tell you where I found it. We're looking for the right. I have some peace. The culture's hungry for it. Our world's hungry for it. The world's looking for the right perspective. I gotta view my problems in the right way. I gotta look at the problems in the right way. I've gotta find an answer to my problems. How do I do that? There's a myriad of options. You know what most of us go to? Something like 85 to 90% of Americans go to with any problem they have. Somebody want to help me out? Wager a guess. I know, full house. Everybody's nervous. Jim, what do you think most people turn to when they're searching? Huh? 
that's a good old school answer. That that is what it used to be. Is it true for you in here? I need a young generation. There you are. What do you think most people go to search for their problems? You know what they do? They Google it. And we Google some of the most insane stuff. Go look at Google Trends sometime, brother, sister. Not now. We're in church. We Google some of the dumbest stuff. You know, one of the most commonly uh, searched for uh, questions on Google is, is the phrase, am I dying? Honey, if you're dying, you shouldn't ask a bot. It's not alive. It doesn't know. <laughs> am I dying? Do I have cancer? Uh, we, we, we Google some of the most insane stuff as though like Google is going to somehow magically replace a doctor who actually cares about human beings, is a human being, and went through between 8 and 16 years of schooling to get certified to practice medicine, which means they're not good at it. It just means they're better than most. We're Googling that. And I, I am having so much anxiety, I am freaking out of my mind. You know what I need to turn to? I need to turn to an inanimate object that has no context for my life whatsoever, condense my entire problem down into a six-word statement, three of which aren't actual words, they're just abbreviations, LOL. And I will find from this magic box called the iPhone, or an Android, some of you Android people, from the Android. All of the answers to my problems, I will find here the meaning of life, the source of peace. I will find here the right perspective on my problems because somewhere, Oprah or someone has written a book, and they will have the answers that I seek. You know what you find? A bunch of empty promises. You find a bunch of empty promises. If I can just switch this circumstance in my life, if I can just manipulate this piece so that it goes in the right, and I'm just here to tell you it doesn't matter if you had some kind of a magic wand straight out of a Mickey Mouse movie and you could, you could zap whatever it is you want to zap, whatever circumstance, whatever mind, if you could manipulate and control everything, what you would find is that humans are lousy at being God. You know where you find the right perspective? Brother, sister, friend, you find it in the Word. As the Spirit of God would wield that in our minds and our hearts. We're looking for peace. We're looking for the right perspective. We're looking for something that lets us know that no matter what, things are in the end going to work out. Little Caleb was not quite three. I didn't think he could hold the door to that porch at the time. We were living over in a little parsonage right there, a little trailer. And I didn't think he could pull open that back porch door, and I was out there with a Fisker's axe splitting firewood. I was talking on the phone while I was doing it because men, we think we can multitask. We cannot. He pulled that door open frozen and hard to get open and as I was talking I split a piece of wood and I'm talking on the cell phone and I bend over with that axe in my hand and I feel something ever so gently get bumped and I heard Caleb cry and I spun around and that tip of that Fisker's axe had come down and just boom, right under his eye his entire face is covered in blood I hung up on my boss I had to explain that one hung up on my boss, shoved my phone in my pocket. I snatched up Caleb. I took a piece of my shirt, ripped it off, and then just stuck it on his face. Amy's walking out of the house. She goes, have you seen Caleb? And I went, yep. And she goes, is he okay? I said, nope. I moved the rag, and she goes, <gasps> and I was like, get in the car. Somebody else will drive. I'm holding this on there, and he is freaking out, and he's crying, and I am handing him things like, daddy's got you. Daddy's got you. I'm handing him stuff like, it's going to be okay, son. And my heart's breaking. Because 
man, I just wounded my son and I didn't mean to. We pull up into the Millersburg uh, ER parking lot and they said, registration's down there. I said, registration, my hind leg. I'll give you my money later. I'm going in that door. They said, that door's locked. I said, it won't be in a minute. Walked up, tried the doorknob, it didn't open, and I just boom, boom, boom. Nurse comes and she goes, oh, what are you doing? You're going to break the door. And I moved the rag and she goes, come on. She pulled me right back into a room and uh, she set me down and she goes, is it in his eye? I said, I don't know how bad it is. So she said, is his eyelid cut? I said, I don't know. Look at it. So we're looking at it and she goes, I think you got extremely lucky. I said, you mean blessed. The doctor comes in and he goes, I'm not going to stitch that because it's too, it's too deep of a cut and it's right by his eye. So what I'm going to do is actually glue it. So I just need you to hold him very still. And so I held his head down and I kept saying stuff like, Daddy's got you. It's going to be okay. Daddy's got you. It's going to be okay. And when you put that stuff in, it burns like fire. A few minutes, it was over and it was done with. We get out of there, and he's hurting, but they give him some ibuprofen and stuff, and we move on our merry way. Fast forward to several years ago. I was up at, at one of my offices there in Orville, and um, he comes running in from outside with his cowboy boots on, and he figures out cowboy boots are great for riding horses, not so great running on wet concrete. He slips and falls, and he busts his lip, splits it wide open. I mean, he, he split it. And I went, all right, so off to the hospital we go. This time we weren't going to Millersburg, and we go over to uh, Dunlap, and, and uh, we walk in the ER, and I said, yeah, my son's split his lip, and he's crying, but he goes, Dad, am I going to be okay? And he didn't speak that clearly. It was a little bit more like, <laughs> you know. He didn't talk to him real well. And, and I said, yes, yeah, son, you're going to be all right. Promise it's going to be okay. You know, that time when the doctor came in and, and, and said, you're going to have to hold really still. You know, I didn't have to pin him down. I didn't have to wrap him up. I didn't have to hold his head still. I looked at him and I said, son, do you trust daddy? And he goes, yes, daddy. I said, you know, daddy loves you. He said, yes, daddy. I said, I need you to hold real still, son. It's going to hurt a little bit at first, but you're going to come through this thing all right. It's going to be okay. He said, I'll hold still. And he held still. You want to know why that is? Because he was old enough. He was at a place where he could receive the promises of his daddy. And we go through these crazy times in our life, and our world is in the craziness that, that it's in, and we are hearing of wars and rumors of wars and stock market crashes and economy, and we've got an election year. Have mercy. 2024 is going to be an election year. It's going to be a presidential election year. Are you ready to hate everybody yet? I'm like, that's where we're at. That's where we're in for. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that, that at the same time we see all the chaos and the trouble and all the issues in our personal life and on the national scale and on the community scale and on the global scale, I'm here to tell you what we have that makes us rock solid as believers is not enough money in the bank, not some underground bunker, not, not, not some stockpile that's going to make us feel safe. What we have that gives us rock solid confidence is the promise of a Father in heaven who says no matter what, I'll work it out together for good. And when you and I are willing to lean into those promises, the world looks at our life and goes, you've got something I desperately need. So are we in for a wild ride? You bet. You bet. But I don't see this thing as a negative, I see it as a positive because the world's hungry to be moved. The world's hungry for some peace. A peace that doesn't need to change the circumstance. It has peace regardless of it. Doesn't matter whether the wind is blowing or not. It's hungry for a perspective that is good and truthful and right. It's hungry for a promise that it has more weight and more truth and more reliability than something spouted on a campaign trail. The 
promise of a good and loving father who says no matter what, I'm here. So yeah, the world is nuts. But I don't see it as a woe is me. I see it as an opportunity that God set before us to be the salt and light he's called us to be in a lost and undying world. Whatever the circumstance is in your mind, Whatever the valley is you find yourself walking through, no matter what the circumstance may be, I may have named it, I may not have come within a country mile of it. Whatever it is that you're struggling with in your life, and I guarantee you there are struggles in your life. Because I've met an awful lot of people, and I've traveled an awful lot of ways, and I've been to an awful lot of churches, and I've been in a whole lot of prisons. I've been from the uttermost to the guttermost and back again. And I have never found anybody that lives problem free. I've met the poor, the poorest of the poor. I've been the poorest of the poor. I've met the richest of the rich. And I'm here to tell you, none of them live problem free. Whatever your problem is, relationally, financially, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, related to your job, related to your children, related to your kids, related to your spouse, related to extended family member, related to old friends, related to you name it, whatever that might be. Let me encourage you in this. In and of yourself, that's what the world tells us. Look within your heart. If you'll just follow your heart, all will be well. Ted Bundy followed his heart, and it didn't lead good places. Just saying. I'm not looking internally for the answers. I'm looking externally to the one who can solve it. That last song we sang was, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I had such a nutty morning, I didn't even get to pick the songs. How crazy is that? Poor Jim had to go back there and hope that whoever picked him did good. Check him out. But I couldn't have picked a better last song before I preached. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And what happens to the things of the world? They all change and get instantly better. It's not what the song says. It says they'll grow strangely dim. They'll pale in comparison. I closed my Bible, so I'm done. Almost. Caleb one time was, we're down at the park in Big Prayer. I said, does Big Prayer have a park? We do. We do. Big Prairie, which is actually small. We have a big park, which is actually pretty small. Caleb had some boys down there that were a little bigger and a little older than him. He was pretty young, and he was nervous. And they, they came up to the tire area. You know, those big tractor tires you can climb up on and stuff. And them boys said, you ain't allowed up here, boy. And I was walking up, and I heard them shout that. I was about 25 yards away, and Caleb kind of backed off. And he looked, tears come up in his eyes. He's about five, six. And he turns around, and he looks up at me, and I look down at him, and I said, do you want to play on the tires? He said, yeah. I said, go play. He turns around, and he goes, my daddy said I can. I'm coming up. boy looked at me and I looked at him and I went and he goes he can play <laughs> I know I know what if you and I stopped looking so much at the problems which make them huge and we caught a glimpse of our Savior if we turn our eyes on him then our problems seem awfully small what happens if you and I walk out of this place, face our problems, and go, my daddy said I'm more than a conqueror. Here I come. Just a thought. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and those that are getting baptized can head to the back and get ready. In a moment, I'll do the same. You can head to the bathroom, guys. Get changed. Come 
just up to this room over here. I don't know the context of your life. I don't know what problems you're facing. I don't know what issues you have. Believer, child of God, brother, sister, I don't know your problem, but I do know your God. Because of that, I can assure you that good or bad, it makes sense or it does not. It's all going to work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And I would encourage you, don't hold on to your problems. Let God have them. Don't put them in the hands of the world. They'll disappoint you. Put them in God's hands. Let go of them and give them to the one who can actually do something about it. Heavenly Father, I would come before you this morning. I don't know where every heart is. There's no doubt a bunch that have tuned in online, and I don't know where their hearts are where their struggles are, where their pains all lie. But I know in the deepest of valleys, I have found you to be faithful. I have found your promises sure. They're rock solid. When I had nothing else to stand upon, I found those promises sure. I know I can trust you. there are moments where they don't seem like they're enough. We want your promises plus. Plus this problem to go away. Plus this circumstance to be resolved. Plus this thing to be shifted. Teach our hearts. Remind us that it is you and you alone that are the source of our comfort, our peace, the right perspective. The power we need to navigate these waters and the promises that underpin our lives. <laughs> it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Isn't God good at all the time? Amen. I'm going to slip into the room over here and change. Uh, while I'm doing so, we'll have a couple gentlemen, if you would, uh, come and move the pulpit, take that heater out, and uh, we'll get rolling.